Thanks, Leonard. I'm pleased to be moderating this uh, third panel, uh, addressing appropriately enough, given our lunchtime discussion, uh, the civil rights aspect of school choice. We have four fabulous speakers on this panel. We're fortunate to have all four of them. We have first Professor Joseph Vitteritti, who is director of the Program on Education and Civil Society at New York University. Uh, he is also a research professor of public administration in the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service and an adjunct professor of law in the School of Law. Uh, he has been active in education policy, has written a great deal in that area, and has also served as special assistant to the chancellor of the New York City Public Schools and as a principal advisor to the superintendents of the schools in Boston and San Francisco. Our second speaker of the afternoon is going to be Jennifer Grossman. Uh, Jennifer, on my right here, uh, has served as director of education for the Cato Institute and also as a speechwriter for President George Bush. She is currently national policy advisor for the Children's Scholarship Fund. A private scholarship fund began, begun by Teddy Forsman and John Walton, whose goal is to provide $200 million in scholarships to as many as 50,000 students in 30 to 50 cities. Our third speaker is going to be Michael Myers. Michael Myers on my left is president and executive director of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. He was born in Harlem and grew up there. And he, before he went to found the, the New York Civil Rights Coalition, he was at a senior staff position at the New Jersey Department of Higher Education, where he served as a special assistant to the Chancellor of Higher Education. He's a protege of Dr. Kenneth Clark and served for nine years as an assistant director in the NAACP to Roy Wilkins. He has written and spoken extensively on education issues and will be here addressing it. The final speaker is on my far right, Clint Bullock. Clint is vice president and director of litigation for Institute for Justice. He's one of the co-founders of Institute for Justice. Uh, IJ has been one of the pioneers in the field of school choice uh, and has been coordinating the litigation of many of the cases. Clint argued in one uh, Jackson versus Benson, the Wisconsin case, and also the Arizona case. And Clint uh, has been on the ground uh, defending school choice programs throughout the country. Without further ado, I move on to Professor Benarit. Such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it 
is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. <coughs> that quote is from uh, Brown v. Board of Education, which was handed down in 1954. Um, I cite it for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, uh, it is a very clear declaration of the idea that people in this country, all children, have a right to a decent education. But it also is a brilliant explanation of how important education is in this country in, in, in fostering equality in a social sense, in a political sense, in an economic sense, uh, in any one way one can deem imaginable. If you don't have a good education, you don't advance. Well, that was 1954. How far have we come? I was referring to a major study that was just uh, published by the Brookings Institution. Uh, the authors were Christopher Jenks and Meredith Phillips. Uh, and it tells us that in 1999, 45 years later, race and class are still the most reliable predictors of educational achievement in this country. And the case is more, most dramatically demonstrated when we look at cities, which have a disproportionate number of poor minority children, and which have a disproportionate number of failing schools. Uh, I refer you to uh, several papers in that volume, and a, and, a, and a new volume being published by Brookings by Mayor and Peterson, Mayor and Peterson which shows that there is a very clear connection between one's ability to earn a living and one's ability to be well-educated. Uh, there is a clear correlation between test scores and earning capacity. Uh, I also point you to several generations of political science research which show that, again, <coughs> educational achievement is very clearly connected to political efficacy in this country and every other country. Jefferson says that an educated citizenry is the best guarantee for a healthy democracy. And without a decent education, people cannot be expected to be equal players in the political process. Um, education is a requirement beyond the kinds of the removal of the kinds of legal barriers that the Voting Rights Act and other kinds of case law have managed to remove. The egalitarian argument becomes even more compelling when you begin to examine the question, who has choice, who wants it, and why? Uh, in some ways, choice is really the ultimate academic issue. Because the fact of the matter is that many people in the United States already enjoy choice. And I'm not just referring to those who can afford to, when they don't like the public school and they really lay out the money and choose to attend a private or religious school. What I mean is that choice takes place through residential mobility when people have the ability to move into communities, into neighborhoods, into districts where the schools work well. There's all kinds of social science evidence to demonstrate this. I won't bore you with it now, um, but it's very clear. Um, when we look at the question of who wants choice, again, the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, Phi Delta Kappa is one organization that has been polling the American public on this issue since 1994. Uh, it, is a, it is a magazine uh, that is read very widely in the education community. And each year, they team up with the Gallup organization to poll people on this issue. And there's definitely been a pattern that shows that the support for vouchers and support for choice has improved gradually over the years. A little slightly more than half of the American public support the idea now of providing public funds for people to attend non-public schools. And when you look at this data and examine it carefully, you find out there's a very strong pattern of support among poor and minority people. I don't think there's any uh, mystery about why that's the case. Uh, that's the case because people whose children get stuck in failing schools year after year are looking for alternatives. 
and that's why they want choice. Um, I just finished a book on this uh, when you guys called me to uh, to talk about this, uh, and it will be published in my book uh, this fall. And the title is Choosing Equality. And in thinking through this equality issue, um, I came to the conclusion that there are really four very compelling arguments for choice if one wants to look at it as an issue of fairness or as an issue of, of uh, equity. And that is the following. The first point is that some people have it and some don't. The second is that whether one has it or doesn't have it in this nation is very much a function of class. The third is that those who don't have it want it. And the fourth is that those who don't have it need it. I think that pretty much scopes out uh, some of the major ingredients of the egalitarian argument. Um, and while we policymakers, lawyers, professors can discuss this uh, ad nauseum, if the debate is going to really take uh, any core, any um, form, uh, we, we've really got to start to listen to what poor people, who are generally not represented at these kinds of things, have to say about it. Um, there's been a continuing debate within the social science community about the efficacy of public schools and private schools. I saw John Woody here this morning. I think he's going to be on this afternoon. I think mean, John was participating in one of the most grueling debates on the impact of choice in Milwaukee. Um, most social scientists will, uh, when you put a bunch of social scientists in the room, and I've, I've been in those kinds of rooms more than I'd like to, um, there's very little agreement on the issue. I am personally convinced that uh, there's a good deal of evidence to show that Catholic schools have done a particularly good job on educating uh, poor minority kids in the inner city, particularly when look, one looks at the graduation rates. But I would tell you, um, even as those debates continue, and we can say that there's not a consensus within the academic and the research community, uh, there is, again, very clear evidence one direction, when one starts to ask the parents of children who have an opportunity to participate in choice programs. And we've got a lot of experience with this. We have now about 1,200 charter schools in the country. Um, we have about uh, 30 states with privately funded voucher programs. We've had, uh, we have two publicly supported voucher programs, or full scholarship programs by some people, in Milwaukee and, and in Cleveland. And while we may debate about the uh, valuations of performance, one thing that I think most people agree on is that when parents are polled on this, parents say they're much happier with the education their kids are getting in the choice schools. And that's a very important piece of information. If we're going to involve parents in this debate at all, that's a very important piece of information. Um, we could sit here and argue those issues from now until next Tuesday. Um, but there seems to be uh, a real flow of information that tells us that poor people are beginning to understand that the schools their children go to are not working for them. Um, one just needs to look at the performance data and you realize that for whatever reason it is, um, we are not serving poor children very well. We are particularly not serving them very well in cities. Um, however one wants to analyze the arguments and, and the data, it is very hard to make the case, and I've never heard anybody make it, that providing children with an opportunity to go to a choice school, whether it be public or private, one, is harmful to those children. We have debates about whether it's going to hurt, quote, public education, but there's no evidence I've seen which shows that it's harmful for those kids who are looking for relief. So one of the things I would consider doing is we need to really switch the debate a bit. And I'm not sure that justification needs to be made um, for uh, promoting choice. I think the justification needs to be made now for denying choice. 
When we talk about choice policy, um, choice policy is something that we can craft in two different ways. Um, to use one term choice to, think, to, to discuss or to describe everything that is going on around this country now is kind of misleading. When I talk about choice, what I'm specifically talking about, and this is if we're going to respond to this as an equality issue, what I am specifically talking about is the policy of choice that is designed to uh, provide more and new opportunity for underserved populations. And it doesn't mean just private school choice. It means interdistrict choice among public schools. It means charter schools. It means private and religious schools. And when I say charter schools, I mean real, a real charter school law. I mean, we've got charter schools now in this country. But most of the times when we pass a charter school law, one of the things that inevitably winds up in the legislation is the limit on how many charter schools can be created. So we have this big debate about whether or not competition will improve public education. And we can't answer that question because we've never passed legislation that allowed competition to take place. Now, we just passed a law in New York which, is going, which allows us to have uh, 50 charter schools in the state. There are 6,000 public schools in New York State. Anybody who believes that 50 charter schools with 200 kids each is going to create competition in that state is misleading themselves. But that tends to be the pattern. So what I, would, um, what I would argue and what I would urge you to do uh, in considering uh, how we might craft policy um, that might help us uh, advance an egalitarian proposition is that we craft policy around the needs of the poor, that we have all kinds of choice, that um, if we have charter schools, we have an unlimited number of charter schools. We allow access to them on a first-come, first-served basis. If there is an oversubscription, the best answer to that is to provide more charter schools. But the immediate answer might have to be to provide uh, access to children who are, who are already attending failing public schools and the alternative. Uh, if we're going to talk about vouchers and help for the poor, then um, I've become persuaded that the Milwaukee model works. If we design a policy that um, provides access to children who meet some kind of academic need, we begin to address the needs of those children who have no other way to make a choice. Uh, if we're going to do that, though, we need, to find, we need to fully fund it. If you're going to provide a child with a voucher, we need to provide them with the full amount that it takes for them to go to that school so that they don't have to pay out of their own pockets uh, uh, the rest of the tuition. We need full funding, uh, and any, any school that participates in a voucher program must accept the voucher as full funding. And um, we need to begin this by addressing those very specific issues. Um, I'm going I'm to close on that because I know we're running out of time, but I'd like to see that time. Thank you, Professor. We now move on to our second speaker, Ms. Jennifer Brooks. Good afternoon. I know you all are probably a little bit uh, tired of having listened to so many speakers jammer on, so I'm going to give you a little bit of relief. And I brought a video that has um, a compilation of some of the news coverage of the Children's Scholarship Fund. I've been to many of these sorts of um, conferences, especially in my former life as a policy analyst. And I know that uh, usually the purpose um, is to give people information. It's very rare that um, people's uh, minds are changed, I, I found, anyway. Um, people usually come to these conferences with, uh, with opinions and are usually seeking information to to confirm them. Um, so I'm just going to give you some information about the Children's Scholarship Fund, especially since we've had a lot of uh, very exciting developments since we started down this path. Well, really, um, in uh, 
uh, last June, um, and then even before that, because um, we, we grew out of an earlier program in Washington, D.C. called Washington Sculpture. So let me show you a little bit of this, if we could get the wire. succeed in life is the goal of a new program that's being funded by a lot of private money. Some big time businessmen are making education and America's poor. They're creating a giant scholarship $200 million fund today. That by venture capital is said for and Wall Street heir John Wall. The Children's Scholarship Fund. Scholarships allowing public school students to transfer to private schools. And for Ted Forsman, it's the latest example of a commitment to those who need help most. Giving poor parents the same choice that people with some money have. Horstman says the project has no ideological agenda. This is really a nonpartisan effort. We're not opposed to anything in particular. We're in favor of children. And we're particularly in favor of equal opportunity for all children. What do you get back from them? They save a life, you save the world. And that's what you get out of it. This millionaire wants to give thousands of scholarships to children. Your child may be eligible. Operators are standing behind. Coming right up. I've got such exciting news for you. If you are a parent who cares about your children's education, if, when you do polls in this country and you ask people, what do you really care about? Isn't that the top of your list? Yeah. Okay. It's the top of my list because I was a deprived colored child who was um, taught at an early age to read by my grandmother. And God knows, had I not had the benefit of learning to read, had the benefit of uh, a, a good education, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. So today we're going to be announcing that up to 40,000, listen to me carefully now, so if you're vacuuming, turn it off. <laughs> okay, you putting that chicken in the microwave thought? Turn it off. Up to 40,000 students in America are going to share millions of dollars in scholarships, and your child could be one of them. Uh, I want to introduce you to the man who's going to be doing this. This is investor Ted Forsman, and he is the mastermind behind this giant scholarship program called the Children Scholarship Fund. Take a look at what Ted Forsman's doing. Ted Forsman is a Wall Street deal maker who's made millions turning around failing companies. Not only does he fly around on his own luxury jet, he's chairman of the company that builds them. He's also a man who puts his money where his heart is, treating injured children in Bosnia, building summer camps for youngsters with special needs. And now, Ted is committing millions of his own money and getting more from some of America's wealthiest to help children learn. He created the Children's Scholarship Fund to help students who can't afford it attend private and parochial schools. America is a great place and help is on the way. That's what this is all about. It's not based on grades, but financial needs. Surprisingly, about 40% of American families would qualify. Of course, it's not a free lunch. Parents would still have to pay part of the tuition, but it's worth it. The pilot program in Washington has given the families new hope for the future. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor. A scientist. A police officer. A lawyer. I want to be a teacher. <laughs> I wanted to be a teacher too, fourth grade teacher. Ted Porter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's to be a part of this show when we heard about what we were doing because all this year and last year too we started what we call the Oprah's Angel Network where we're asking people to extend themselves in kindness and when I heard about what you were doing with the Children's Scholarship Fund I thought this was more than an act of kindness it really is extraordinary that you, you and um, Mr. Walton would take a hundred million dollars I was wondering, I was 
saying to you, in fact, were you a deprived, uh, you weren't a deprived Negro child, we know. <laughs> Were you some kind of deprived child who didn't have an education and decided you wanted to grow up and do it for other people? No, I was actually a uh, child that had a very good education that, and I was lucky I got into business and did pretty well. And I wanted to uh, share that. And I've always kind of had a, an interest in kids that had a rough deal. And I think in America now, that uh, poor kids um, have a very rough deal with respect to education because the system really isn't working for them. Yeah. Is it, it's not that you're anti-public schools. No, 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 no. I'm anti-bad schools, and I'm in favor of good education. And um, we started this uh, idea last year in Washington, and we gave away a 1,000 scholarships, and we weren't sure that poor people would apply. So you have now already a 1,000 kids who are in this area? Yes, a 1,000 in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. And 8,000 poor mothers applied for their kids, so we knew there was a demand. Uh -huh. And so thanks to you today, we're announcing on your show that any parent in America can call 1-800-805-KIDS and apply for a, a scholarship through us. We're going to be giving away 40,000 of them. And lottery day is April 22nd. Okay, well, I wanted to make sure that you did get the 1,800 number because the deadline for applications is only four days away. So I know you guys are just going to rush to your phones. Um, but I, did, I didn't want to show you the entire tape because I thought that was probably shocking enough to be showing a uh, tape Oprah to a policy conference, <laughs> but um, it's, it's actually uh, been one of the, the many surprises that we have um, encountered since we started out. And, and this is really the level that the Children's Scholarship Fund is, um, is moving on. And I would argue um, really the, the area where you are getting the biggest change and the biggest momentum, yes, there's had things happening within the minority community, yes, there's things happening within uh, the legal uh, system. Yes, there's movement happening in um, political community. But in this sort of larger uh, popular culture, um, the regular conventional wisdom, the things that people would consider uh, sacred, and then all of a sudden begin to think that they could be challenged, that's really beginning to change. I, I think that nowhere um, is that more dramatically demonstrated uh, than in the, um, the board of advisors that uh, Mr. Forsman has been able to assemble, um, including Martin Luther King III, Andy Young, who has been absolutely, incredibly passionate uh, in advancing the, the idea that every child deserves a chance and every parent deserves a choice, um, and uh, the idea that uh, we can improve education for all through um, through competition. Uh, then on the other spectrum, we've got uh, Will Smith and uh, baseball legend Sammy Sosa, Barbara Bush and Christian Bowles, um, Colin Powell and uh, the first uh, Secretary of Education, Joe Califano, Bob Johnston, uh, Johnson of um, Black Entertainment Television, Tom Preston, head of MTV, um, Jill Barad, Chairman and CEO of Mattel, Jim Kinsey, uh, founder of America Online, uh, Senators Tom Daschle, and Trent Lock, he literally goes on and on, and I can probably use that there just talking about it. And um, it's very exciting. It, it really, I think, demonstrates that uh, that people are beginning to, to, to change, and to, uh, there's, you know, I, I love Fanny, uh, Fanny Lewis's line, that um, if I can put up with, uh, with 51% of you, then I, yeah, I can buy the rest of you. And I think that they're, Tom, Tom Daschle and, and Ken Watt are not going to ever be able to agree on um, um, political uh, legislation uh, to whether it's doctors or private schools or whatever. But the fact that they are uh, beginning to at least uh, in, in the private sector, in the philanthropic sector, um, begin to get on board and, and, and an effort like this is very encouraging. So, so how, did it, how did it begin? Um, Ted alluded to it briefly. For him, I think it began much earlier. He, he has a, a background um, in philanthropy, especially with regards to, to children around the globe. Um, and he had, for about 10 years, been uh, funding scholarships through the uh, Inner City Scholarship Fund in New York. 
which is run out of the diocese. Um, and he had seen some figures there that began to challenge some of his preconceptions uh, about education. He, you know, got a business to run, so it's not a full-time career for him. Um, and he thought that, well, why don't we try an experiment? Why don't we go to a city like Washington, D.C. and, you know, open it up to, to uh, children and open it up to, to all <coughs> private schools um, that, that would be available. And so we did that. Uh, Ted and John Walton, through the Washington Scholarship Fund, um, made a 12 <coughs> scholarship available in Washington, D.C. Uh, again, a lottery program, um, again, based on need. And uh, we got, as Ted said, nearly 8,000 applications. Um, that was, I think, for some people, uh, another surprise, because this was coming on the heels of essentially an ongoing debate that's been happening in Washington about whether or not a Washington, D.C. parents would want uh, choice through, through some sort of uh, voucher legislation um, or tax credits. And uh, none other than um, Ted Kennedy has said, has insisted that parents and ministers and local leaders have made it clear that they do not want school choice. Eleanor Holmes Norton, the district's very own delegate, has also said, I think I can say with confidence that the people I represent would deeply resent uh, the imposition of choice. And so, um, you know, getting to, to, to what Fannie Lou said, we need to start with reality. We need to start with reality before we can have a debate about the ethics or, or a debate about the logistics. And, and one of the pillars of, of that reality has to be whether or not parents um, want this. And, and I, I think I, I'd like maybe some of the other panelists to address this. Sometimes what I hear um, in the meetings that I've been to and some of the focus group material that I've looked at, when people say that parents don't want <coughs> parents don't want expanded opportunity, what I'm really hearing is those parents really don't want it. Those parents really can't handle it. Those parents can't get <coughs> their act together, can't get their life together. And so, you know, what kind of choices would they be making and those choices would most certainly be inappropriate. And it's funny, I mean, having listened to, to um, Andrew Wilson, you're almost hearing uh, an echo of uh, what you heard at the beginning of the um, education debate in this country, uh, a, a deep concern about um, whether or not certain parents are too apathetic to take charge of their children's education, or whether or not um, they have the correct values and would make the correct judgments about their child's education, whether or not that judgment, in fact, should be delegated. <coughs> To, to govern. Um, so, at least in Washington, D.C., people seem to want choices. Now, maybe that's because Washington, D.C. system is notorious, and maybe nothing works in Washington, D.C., maybe it's water. Who knows? We, we just don't know. Um, we have a hunch that probably since uh, other inner city areas uh, show similar uh, uh, bad situations with test scores and violence in school that um, there would be a demand for this, but this is exactly what we're going to find out on April 21st. Um, we, back in, in June, we announced that there would, um, that we would do a 200, well, actually, a uh, 100 million that, that Ted and Mr. Walton put forward, uh, and that they would go out and they would find the cities where we would set up programs, cities where um, there was capacity and uh, where uh, there was a really a need. For, for scholarships. Um, in October, we announced um, another 70 million that we had raised, raising it to 170 million. And we announced uh, programs in 40 cities and three entire states. Uh, as you saw on the tape, one of the things that, that Ted was getting concerned about when he saw that there were, the demand was uh, not only as great as it was in Washington, D.C., but, but really even greater, that, that, that people weren't going to have a chance, that people were going to be left out. And so that's when, when they came up with um, additional funds, bring it up to 200 million, and um, offer it to any, anybody, um, any child uh, who qualified by income anywhere in the United States. So again, the, the 
the deadline hasn't been reached, so we don't have hard and fast figures for uh, what the demand is and um, what the application number um, is. But, but we have received applications from all 50 states, uh, from Puerto Rico, from Guam, from over 20,000 um, cities across America. Uh, the demand in Washington is exponentially greater than we initially found it. It's going to be impossible unless we're living in parallel universes uh, to any more, to any longer deny that there is uh, a, a demand, and not just a, a demand for um, a handout, uh, a demand for uh, something which requires significant sacrifice on, on the part of these parents. These are parents who a have to be low income to uh, qualify for the scholarships, who are already getting their education product for free, uh, and who are have to um, contribute on average a thousand dollars to supplement the part of the scholarship. So, um, and, as we've seen in some of the, the cities where, um, where we've been doing this, these are parents that are having to take on uh, extra jobs and really uh, go the extra mile. And the other thing that we're finding is that it really does refute the argument that well, it will only be the best for creaming, so it will be the best and the brightest, the most motivated. Um, I think that also takes a static view of, of what happens when when choice becomes available, when opportunity becomes available, when hope um, exists. It's not just that uh, motivated parents reach for scholarships. It's that scholarships and that the opportunity helps to create motivated parents. That these parents who had hitherto not really thought that there was an opportunity for them, that um, they begin to, to uh, not only make sacrifices to get more involved in the children's education, but also become uh, heavily involved with making sure that they are getting their money's worth um, from, from their new scholarship schools. So that's, that's where we are. I think that you will all be um, listening on um, April 21st. And uh, then you know, the next step, it, it, it goes back to, to you and the policy community and in the political community um, once it is established that um, this is not something that's been thought up by um, some people in the uh, policy context, but be that there is a, a profound and serious um, demand for, for opportunity. And I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. I, I, again, I agree with Fannie Lewis when she said that when people in the community get together and they demand change, that um, nothing yeah, can stop them. So I think that this is going to be very positive.
legal question, unfortunately, too narrowly a legal question. And what will it take to build a bridge to a 21st century American democracy? Should we dare to dream of disestablishing the dual society root and branch, just as we dreamt once upon a time of desegregating the public school system of America? Are we going to construct alternate systems where school choice is an opting out, a ratification of white flight, and the reinforcement of black isolation? Is black and Hispanic isolation in America inevitable? Is it an inevitable sidekick of choice? Are we content on gilding the gal with faith-based charter schools, giving parents vouchers to buy what was once a promise of free education? Is equality in education something that can be bought with a voucher? given to several thousand of a system of billions, a system where billions are consigned to the donkeys. I agree, public education is in need of reform, radical reform. It is in need of shaking up. Yeah, we need smaller classes. We need better prepared and well prepared, effective, compassionate, empathetic teachers. We need competent leadership without tenure. We need school personnel who will be measured based on academic achievement. We need teacher accountability. We need interested students and involved parents. We need books and computers and resources. We need godfathers and godmothers with power and wealth speaking up for, working on behalf of public schools and the masses of our children who are left behind. What I don't want is religion in the public schoolhouse. And I don't want public dollars diverted to private independent schools. Let me say something about religion and its overlay to race in this debate. The civil rights movement was led by preachers. Some of those preachers turned to politics. Some of our politicians have turned to preachers preaching about ghetto conditions, preaching about repairing Negroes as opposed to repairing school buildings. It's a missionary zeal in everything we hear about those little dog people. And rather than abolishing ghettos, whether they're even thinking about abolishing ghettos, we are putting in place the strategies for gilding ghettos. We are faced with those pictures everywhere I go, whether it's over video, pictures of the New York Times, pictures across America. We are faced with those pictures of uniform black youths in disciplined independent schools, some in faith-based charter schools, some in Afrocentric schools, where the theology is black pride. You don't have to sit next to a white child to get a good education. Well, guess who said that in the history of America? It's the flip side of your white child can get a quality education without the presence of black kids. And so they have. Reverend Floyd Blake observed, integration has not always meant equality for inner city youth. And in any case, despite the good intentions of mainstream civil rights organizations, the nation's schools have worked backward toward an era of renewed segregation. And Reverend Flake noted that public school vouchers spell good news to school reformers, black and Hispanic nationalists, I quote, black and Hispanic nationalists and integrationists too, unquote. Now good news to both black nationalists and integrationists sounds to me like an law. <laughs> it sounds like an inconsistency, a contradiction in the message. Clearly, the public is fed up. Clearly, the public is losing confidence in schools' ability to educate so-called at-risk kids. 
said schools are already segregated, they say. Let those who think they can school those children do so. Black disciples of pragmatism, reality, want control of the ghetto school for self-help reasons. In their eyes and in their minds, self is always defined as race. African American Immersion Academy, at one African American, African American, American Immersion Academy, children are actually taught, and I quote, to think black, act black, speak black, buy black, pray black, love black, and live black, unquote. This is what we're doing in the context of equalizing educational opportunity. We are institutionalizing racial dogma. We are institutionalized in indoctrination. Supposedly, in the, on the, on the, in the guise of helping these children deal with their circumstances. Their circumstances, of course, being trapped in the ghetto and in ghetto schools. I suppose parents ought to have the choice to choose such a school as the one I just mentioned but not with, with, with the tax dollars of the public treasury. No more so than I would approve the government giving vouchers to parents who send their kids to faith-based schools that place crosses, either literally or figuratively, on the back of the necks of their charges. Holy, holy, hallelujah. Is this hostility for religion? I hope so. The public treasury should not be rated to endorse the religious message. It should not be rated to finance religious activity. No public funds should be expended for any sectarian schools. Black and law, Myers law. Speaking of religion in the schools, we in the civil rights movement recall the reaction of at least one Southern gentleman a U.S. congressman to the Engel versus Vital decision where the Supreme Court declared New York's non-denominational prayer to be unconstitutional, expressing his shock, his dismay, his outrage. The congressman linked the Engel decision to the court's 1954 Brown decision, exclaiming, the Supreme Court put the Negroes in the schools, and now they have driven, they've driven God out. Preach. Politicians are preaching, and the preachers have turned into politicians. This is context. It is very important context to understand the notion of tuition tax credits, the notions of vouchers, the notion of hostility to truly well education opportunity for the majority population. Because if, after all, whether the rights resistance to desegregation mandate, which included the creation of white academies, calls for tuition tax credits for religious and private school education subsidized by tax dollars. Community standards, they said. Fear of the overall deterioration of the quality of life. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. With desegregation, white fled. Now this history is hard to face. It's harder to talk about in 10 minutes. It's easy to forget. This history, this dual society, renders school choice illusory. Today, American urban public schools are more racially segregated than ever. This is not a condition of choice, at least not for blacks. Black children not only do not have an equal chance as their white peers in the suburbs, they have virtually no chance of attending a public school where white children are in the majority. And don't forget the Brown decision that suffered for equal harms the Negro child in ways unlikely ever to be undone. Do we really believe that? Do we believe it then? The answer to both questions, based on the evidence, is no. Consequently, for many inner city children, they are schooled separate and apart from the majority group and vice versa. Don't forget that, vice versa. 
we are still no more separate and unequal in the field of public education. Never had there been a free market for blacks. Racial steering denied that. Housing discrimination denied that. Disinvestment denied that. We are more segregated today. Not because of busing, but in spite of busing. There ain't no bus that can get Negro kids from the city to the suburbs and from the suburbs to exurbia, white flight. We give web service is a great equal opportunity, but we practice segregation. Why aren't Oprah Winfrey and the others talking about the notion and the nature and the extent and the pervasiveness of this racial segregation? Because it's not fashionable to talk about. It's hard talking about segregation. It's hard talking about history. It's hard to do anything about it. Other than trying to save a few souls and feeling good about it. Save a few souls in a religious context. give lip service to integration, but we practice irrigation, and we practice a feat educational snobber. Dean Hughes Scott writes, quote, self-interest makes school choice in, a, in almost any form attractive to parents of all races. This may drive many black and Latino middle class parents to overlook the broader destructiveness of vouchers and tax credits for less advantage to those of color. At best, these options will only provide limited opportunities for non-whites. Vouchers and tax credits are designed to help those schools that need help the least, private schools serving the affluent, unquote. Who will get to opt out? Again, Pauline Scott, well, those whose parents are better able to manipulate the system, those whose parents can call 800, no less on each. Those who can advocate for their children to provide transportation to schools outside their neighborhoods and to augment vouchers with personal funds. Nonetheless, Reverend Floyd Floyd preaches that low income minorities will benefit by saying, by staying in their own communities. Quizzically, he nostalgically recalls the era of judiciary segregation. We recall, he writes, what it was like to go past white schools in order to go to the small segregated schools. We received an education in spite of the prevailing thought that we were being educated in inferior settings by inferior teachers. What those teachers brought to the process was a conviction that every child could learn, every child had value and worth, and if cultivated could achieve. They challenged us to understand that it was not what was on the cover of the used book, but what was inside it. And if we got that between our ears, nobody could ever take that away from us. One of the things we have lost in the process of change toward integration has been the level of respect performance and meeting standards within the public school system, unquote. Integration, he concluded, has not worked because it's a one-way street, unquote. Now, ironically, some ministers, they who believe in heaven, preach that we need to deal with reality. Integration, in their view, is pie in the sky, by and by. I consider that to be hypocritical. But I speak as a heretic. I speak for those who will have no choice. So, some ministers want government subsidies of their schools, where they will repair blacks rather than repair school board, school buildings, and rather than reform public education. We can be glad, <coughs> they say, that we have used books. After all, the Bible is to them the most used book in human history. This is paternalism. This is an inversion of the rhetoric. This is not civil rights. This is not equal opportunity. This is self-interest, and they would preach it. Finally, I need this. Oh, briefly, Theodore Cross, another heretic, who points out 
the consequences of our having abandoned school integration and, and how it integrates. He says, to abandon school and health integration would be an error of catastrophic proportions with harmful economic consequences for the future of the entire black population. And he remonstrates that the reason integrated education and living are indispensable to achieving racial equality has more to do with economic opportunity, power, and mobility than with traditional educational and social objectives. The young person who grows up in a community of economically successful people will have greater economic power and chances of success. The distribution of economic power inherent in family, connections, friendships, and luck, as well as superior information about economic opportunities, will always strongly favor those who are physically situated in the economic and social mainstream of our society. That's why white people don't live in the inner cities. The right place to be for them is always in close proximity to the events and the people who control employment opportunities, admissions, and access to institutions of all times. Because of prior segregation cross rights, and because of racial subordination, these advantaged places of schooling and living are presently occupied almost exclusively by whites. Unless blacks have equal access in space and time to all the physical playing fields of competition, equal opportunity rules will be of little avail even to the most dedicated. Even to the most dedicated hard-working, and gifted black students. So as a consequence of our collective, individual abandonment of the civil rights movement and its goals of integration of racial and social economic integration, we get over the most successful black woman in America, asking black parents who are trapped in the dumb heaps of our public education system to give on the wall, a call on an 800 number. Just call 1 800, no less oblique, and everything will be all right. You will have heaven on earth. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> get stirred up after uh, listening to Michael. So um, heck, I agree with every word that Michael said, all the way up to when he congratulated the Federalist Society for doing the event today. Uh, uh, I do too. Um, and in fact, I was glad you brought up the airfare thing, because um, I'd like to be the first to volunteer to save the Federalist Society money by flying me to Paris next time and stuff. <laughs> so, um, they're both on the river. Yeah, this is true. This is true. It is uh, a pleasure not only to be here. I was really delighted um, when the Federalist Society decided to put this forum together. I think it is long overdue. I agree with Ted before, who said that this is the most important issue in America. Um, but it also was a real excitement to me to speak at a school choice conference in which I'm not talking about the litigation stuff. And we had a, a wonderful panel of six people who are a lot smarter than I am uh, discussing that this morning. Or even the policy stuff. But rather, the issue that I think makes this one as exciting and resonant as it is, and that is, the issue of school choice as the uh, civil rights issue of the millennium. Um, this work, uh, litigating in support of school choice programs, is, it, is difficult work. Uh, we coined the motto a few years ago that if you have a school choice program, you have a lawyer. And anytime you offer high quality, good legal services for free, you do not have a shortage of uh, people looking to, uh, to take advantage of that. And in this instance, I'm very, very glad about that. That means that our docket is always full and thankfully grown. 
Um, but beyond that, we are, every single time we go to court, we are in court against one of the biggest coalitions of special interest groups ever assembled inside a courtroom. But you know what? That's part of what makes it not only tough, but absolutely exhilarating. Um, in fact, if we could choose the people on the other side, we would choose exactly who is there. This is a civil rights movement, and that is why, no matter how hard the work may be, no matter how tough the struggle may be, at the end of the day, there is tremendous joy. I was a toddler in the 1960s. I was not a part of that civil rights movement, but I tell you, I'm not going to miss out on this one. Because the things that unite civil rights movements in this country are a number of things. First of all, a very, very strong moral imprimatur, an idea of black and white, of, of wrong uh, versus right. Um, and also, all of the civil rights movements in our country have tapped into the unfinished business of making good on the most basic American principles and values. The first civil rights movement was the abolitionist. The second was the movement to gain equality of opportunity. And frankly, I believe that we are part of the third great civil rights movement, the movement for individual empowerment. In fact, all of them have been about individual empowerment, but this more than any before. I was pleased that Joe Vitteretti started by asking the question, what is civil rights? And I think the fact that we're discussing whether this is a civil rights movement is precisely because over the last few decades, we have lost sight of the meaning of the concept of civil rights. Sometimes I and my, my colleagues have been accused of being ahistorical, and yet when I look at recent civil rights books, they almost all start in the 1950s or the 1960s. Civil rights in this country and the civil rights movement in this country started before a nation even was born. It was a civil rights movement. And Martin Luther King, I think one of the aspects that made him so successful was that he keenly understood that what he was talking about was nothing new. It was old. It was, as he put it, cashing on a promissory note to which every American was heir since the, since the uh, founding of our, of our nation. The concepts of individualism, universality of rights, equality of rights, these are all at issue on the front lines in the battle for school choice. <clears throat> These arguments permeated Brown versus Board of Education, as Joe quoted from that opinion. That case was not about forced busing. It was not about compulsory racial balance. It was about disestablishing a system of segregation where black youngsters were being bussed past their neighborhood schools to inferior schools because of their race. Oddly, since we've gotten into amnesia over the meaning of civil rights, in 1999 there are communities in our country where black children are bussed past their neighborhood school to inferior schools because they are black, and that is called the remedy for the underlying violation. I, would invite you all to imagine that instead of going down the road of forced busing, which has contributed to the devastation of dozens of inner city school systems around the country, by contributing to the weight plate that Mike Myers talked about, by undermining the tax base, by segregating the schools more than ever before, and in fact, in Kansas City recently, I thought we, we finally had seen the, the ultimate in, uh, in where this philosophy takes us. The plaintiffs pointed out, we've spent all of this money, we've engaged in all of this, this massive social engineering, and you know what? Nobody's test scores have gone up. Except they argued that that meant that there had to be more of the same. To me, it suggests that we need to break the mold in a radical fashion and to return to the original goal of school desegregation, the original goal of civil rights, and that is to fulfill at last one of the most sacred promises ever issued in this country, and that is the promise of an equal educational opportunity for every school child in America, white or black, 
rich or poor. And imagine if that was the route we had gone in the 1950s, allowing each child to pursue the educational opportunity that, uh, that was best for them. Well, it is not too late to do that. And in fact, one of the, one of the movements that has somewhat supplanted the, the forced busing movement is the so-called educational equity movement, uh, where, uh, again, there is a tremendous moral imperative to eliminate the funding inequalities in our society, just as there was a compelling moral mandate to curb uh, practices of segregation. But again, the remedy is totally out of whack with the underlying violation. Imagine this. Kids are in bad school systems. They have funding disparities. And the remedy is to give the school systems that are failing these kids more money. Imagine if General Motors said that to someone that they had sold a lemon to, a totally defective car. In, and, a, and a plaintiff goes to court, and the court says, we have the remedy. We are going to give General Motors more money to figure out how to produce a better car. And maybe, at some point in your lifetime, you might be able to buy that car. I think you would leave the courtroom feeling slightly unsatisfied. Well, that is why parents are feeling unsatisfied. We have a guarantee of education in this country, and we have no money back guarantee, or a money back uh, remedy for uh, the default on that product. The other aspect in which this is very much a civil rights struggle is that even though the people who are most suffering from the uh, denial of people of educational opportunities are a finite group in our society, many people who do not have themselves that same interest, because their kids are doing better, have thrown in their lot together. Freedom fighters working with people who are unfree in our society. And we are putting together coalitions like in the 1950s and 1960s that are unprecedented. In this case, liberal, excuse me, libertarians and conservatives working with low-income people who are predominantly minority. Um, toward a common goal of educational emancipation. Um, just to give you some examples, um, in, uh, in Milwaukee, uh, the program, the parental choice program, uh, even though it was opposed in court, actually challenged in court by the NAACP, commands, according to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the support of 90% of the African American community. The Joint Center for Political Studies has done extensive polling on school vouchers and found that uh, support for school vouchers among African Americans is extremely high, but it is highest among the age cohort between 30 and 37, uh, precisely the age range in which you are mo most likely to have kids. There, the support for school choice was 80% in favor and 9% opposed. The Washington Post, in the aftermath of the veto by President Clinton of the DC scholarship bill, giving rise to the comment uh, by Polly Williams that, that Bill and Hillary Clinton should not be the only people who live in public housing <laughs> who get to send their kids to private schools. Um, the Washington Post found something very interesting when they too found very overwhelming support among black residents of the District of Columbia for school choice. They broke it down by income. And it turned out that black residents with incomes $50,000 and above were evenly split on the issue. Black residents, 50,000 and below, nearly three to one in favor of school choice. This is an issue that separates the leaders from the led um, uh, in, in in the minority community. Um, I remember reading recently, who's the, uh, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Bond, uh, Julian. Julian Bond, the new uh, head of the NAACP, yeah, the chairman, thanks, um, was quoted in Emerge magazine. He was asked, you know, your organization has been losing members by the tens of thousands in recent years. Is there a problem with the leadership? And Bond said, and I swear this is true, he said, 
There is no problem with the leadership. The problem is with the followership. <laughs> what we are discovering now that indeed you cannot lead if there is no followership. And the reason that the people are not following is because they do not want to follow where the so-called leaders are leading. This, I think, though, is also an epiphany for many of us who call ourselves conservatives and libertarians. You know, we talk about these issues and these ideas all too often in the abstract. And where this movement has helped lead us is the recognition that we have got to get beyond abstract philosophical arguments and into the real world, as Jennifer Grossman and others have talked about so eloquently today. We've got to humanize and personalize the freedom philosophy and giving people control over their children's education. There is nothing more liberating than we that, that, that could possibly happen in our society. It also, and this is a source of joy as well, frankly as a lawyer, um, working constantly with parents and children and having the NAACP and the ACLU on the other side, it absolutely drives them nuts. It absolutely does. The ACLU lawyer, Jeff Castle, one time when I walked into the courtroom with a whole bunch of families, he said, in Milwaukee, he said, oh, here comes Clinton, his children again. And I thought, isn't this interesting how the tables have really begun to turn? where the ACLU and groups like that purport, and the National Education Association, you would think an organization with the name education in its title would actually have some children on their side in the litigation. There aren't any. They're all on the other side. And frankly, I think we ought to do a heck of a lot more of that as conservatives and libertarians. Actually get into the trenches and represent the real interests of real people. I want to finish very, very briefly with an anecdote. One of the things that the inst we learned at the Institute from Ju for Justice from our uh, liberal friends in public interest law is that it is very important to humanize litigation when it is about people's rights. And so we like to work to where parents and children are not only represented in the courtroom, they are actually in the courtroom so that they can see what's happening. And so it's very, very clear to the judges that this is not just about abstract legal issues, but about real lives. The last time we went to the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court, uh, just about a year ago now, it was our practice to charter a bus uh, to bring kids and parents who were interested in coming from Milwaukee to Madison. This last time we asked our friends to do that again. They put out the word, and it turned out we did not get a bus. We got 16 buses. And we all gathered on the steps of the state capitol where the court uh, is located. And it was the first time that I had sang songs that have not been sung all that often since the 1960s. This is a civil rights movement. It is about the real lives, the rights, the most fundamental rights of people in our society. And I'm proud to be a part of it. When I look around this room, I see people who have, who have devoted their selves, heart and soul to this battle. And I want to, to conclude with a, with a quote from one of the first voucher advocates in the United States. Also, the first person that I have found to have actually used the term civil rights, the guy ahead of his time, a guy named Tom Paine. And Tom Paine, uh, living in this earlier era, faced challenges that make ours today look simple by comparison. But he said this, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, but we have this consolation. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Thank you, my friends. Okay, we have some time for questions. Questions or comments? Uh, Quinn, uh, what is the civil right to choice? And where is it lodged in the Constitution? I would place it, Mike, in the uh, and the guarantee of equality under law in the federal constitution. 
um, where every, which has, I think, in, properly been interpreted to guarantee each child, as Joe quoted from Brown versus Board of Education, with an equal educational opportunity. Beyond that. That's not in the federal constitution. Yes, that is in the federal constitution. It doesn't mention the word education. 14th no. Amendment. Well, I'm about to write a grievance decision. Uh, no. okay. Let me rephrase my question. OK. If the state got out of the business of education entirely, would that be a violation of the civil right? And if so, which one? No, it would not, Mike. But I, I would put it exactly the way the Supreme Court put it in 1954. Education, where a state has undertaken uh, that function, is a right that must be made available equally to all. Beyond that, and that's and, and I do believe that that, ex that is a reflection of the most traditional <laughs> natural rights view of civil rights. Beyond that, almost every state has created an affirmative right to education in their constitutions as well. And so long as there is such a right, it seems to me that that right ought to be enforceable. Could I just respond to that a bit? Um, I think the Brown decision does talk about the, it does talk about the right to an equal opportunity in education. But um, I'm, I'm reluctant to get too caught up in the, in the legal definition of what a right is. I think the more the, the more appropriate context is, is, a, is kind of a moral obligation society has to provide every kid with a decent education. Uh, and the understanding that I think is very well articulated in the Brown decision, which says that without a decent education, it can have no chance. Well, let's not forget that the Brown decision was not a question of the right to education, it was a question of equal protection of the law that was denied black children by virtue of their race going into the public schoolhouse. And it's, it's the court, it's the court in Brown which, which cited modern psychological evidence to, to demonstrate that the Negro child, uh, by consequence of forced segregation, their personality development was, was, uh, was damaged in ways unlikely ever to be undone. And I, you know, Clint, I love you, Clint. But when you say you too, when, you, when you say that you, know, you say, when you say when you say you bring your children into court, you know, plaintiffs by definition in this context have children as their clients. The NAACP, if they were the plaintiff, would have children as their clients, just like in the Brown versus Education decision. Basically. <laughs> Two things. Uh, one thing well, you should tell the story. First of all, about the Supreme Court in Wisconsin and how it actually worked the first time. When the kids were brought into the courtroom and, and, and Skip Courtney had them lined up, they, every 15 minutes or so, every 10 minutes, they switched because there weren't enough seats. And it was telling the way that court was going to rule because you watched them. Every time those kids walked out, with every eye, all seven eyes followed every kid. Uh, and then the new one just came back then. Uh, inside, have you got any inside dope for me, Clint, on what happened with the 8 to 1 turned out in? Objectively, now, why did they turn? What's your guess on why they turned it down? Um, they, referring to the Wisconsin case, I, I just, I, I don't know. Um, Were you surprised? Pardon me. Were you surprised? I was a little surprised, except for the fact that I think that the uh, the lawyer who is in the worst position to evaluate his or her chances in that kind of context is someone actually involved in the sure. case, and I knew I was too close to it to be objective about. You know whether they were going to take it. I wanted them to take it, as as I think you know. Uh, but uh, I I don't know why they didn't take it. I mean, one view is, uh, and in fact, Ted, you may want to speculate about this as well. Um, uh, one view is this is the first case. There isn't a, a split in authority. Another is that no one knew exactly who would have a majority on the court. Uh, but. You know, we feel very, very confident uh, about you know our 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 chances based on our reading of, of Supreme Court precedents, and that's why we took the unusual step of supporting review in that case. So we shall we shall see. I I, I wish I, I did have some inside information because I would desire it very much, but I don't. Uh, and, and I think I, I agree with you, Clint, uh, uh, on both points that. Uh, there was not a split in authority, which is the traditional uh, primary reason the court will grant cert. And beyond that, I think that there is uncertainty on both sides of the aisle um, <coughs> as to how the court would 
resolve something like this. And I think a lot of justices are very leery of bringing an issue up there for fear that uh, you bring it up there and the court will muck it up one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. Myers, you <clears throat> had spoke very passionately about the uh, integrative ideal. And I, uh, I wonder what you make of the fact, and I think it's a fact, I, I could be wrong, that in many inner cities, the only place where the ideal of integration has any reality at all is in these Catholic schools. Now, maybe you were being facetious with the uh, you know, heretic and on religious point, but it does seem like if we really hold true to that ideal, the only place it's happening is in, the, is in these Catholic schools. And if that's true, why are we bashing the Catholic schools? Well, I'm not bashing Catholic schools. I think anybody in town who wants to send his or her child or their children to Catholic school have a right to do so. If you have the opportunity to do so, you have the opportunity to pay for it. I don't want the tax dollars going following children to religious institutions, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Jewish, whether it's any kind of sector, whether it's wherever we go, flakes, church school, I don't care what religion. I don't want children taking public money to religious sectarian school because I'm just happily one of those people, and I don't know where the polls are, Clint, but I'm one of those people who really believes rather strenuously, vigorously, strongly in the separation of church and state. Um, so I don't understand this poll stuff. You know, you know, we, we use polls to say we're in favor of Clinton, we're against Clinton. We use polls to say we're in favor of integration, we're opposed to the integration. Clint, you talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Rather passionately, Clint, you did good. But, you know, it was Martin Luther King Jr. who lived long enough to see himself going into a minority of the blacks because the younger generation, well, and I think this is what Julie was maybe alluding to, the younger generation was moving more, more and more angry, frustrated, talking about black pride, talking about black nationalism, talking about black power and black violence. And in that regard, if Martin Luther King Jr. were living today, he'd probably be in the minority of those polls. Assuming the polls are correct, because you ask a person, if they ask me if you believe in school choice, I say, yeah. John, I believe in school choice. Whether or not there, there is a thing in school choice, whether or not school choice is a, is a misnomer or just an illusion, if you ask me more specifically my views on, on, on the question, um, you get a different kind of answer. So at least polls can be taken here or there. Or they swing back and forth. Can I, mean, well, so I, I didn't ask that very well. I guess, why do you think, or do you have any uh, opinion on why it is that these Catholic schools or, or inner city religious schools of any kind are doing better and bringing kids of different races together without the government? You know, I, I've looked at that a little bit. I, I think they're better. It's comparative. They're better integrated because the public schools are so poorly integrated. So what you have is a pattern of, of minority kids going into schools that have a mix of minority and, and white kids. But, but I have to emphasize that most of the research shows they're not going there because they want to integrate the education. They're going there because they want a decent education. Um, and they happen to be a little better integrated. Um, and as far as the polls are concerned, I think polls are important because it tells you the way people are thinking. And um, what the polls are also saying is a, a very good uh, poll by Public Agenda, which is a very nonpartisan uh, organization that just was released. It shows that minority uh, parents, the major thing on their mind now is to get a decent education for their kids. And sure, they think that integration is a good thing, but the primary interest in their, that they have is to have their kids go to a decent School. And that's why a lot of the, a lot of uh, inner city parents are opting out and are, and are going into charter schools and are going into uh, private schools because they just want a better education for their kids. Yeah, but the, but the answer to the question also is that you know uh, Catholic schools, private schools, they are not public schools. They public private schools are not obligated or to, to follow the kind the same kind of regulations that you have in public schools. I mean, there's a, there's a ritual requirement, they can keep your foot out of there. Uh, they have uh, different teaching philosophies and, 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 and they're small, and generally smaller classes and, and, and so you guys, you're talking in two different universes. Well, 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 they have different teaching philosophies. One of the philosophies that every kid in the school can learn, one of the philosophies is more focused yes, on academic, on academic courses rather than other kinds of courses, the same kinds of courses that you don't like. Uh, one of the other things about the philosophy is, is we say that we throw kids out of there, but uh, I've talked to people in the, in the uh, uh, private school, in the uh, Catholic schools, 
they don't throw kids out like that. I mean, that, I think that's a myth. Um, if you look at the parish schools in the inner city, uh, you'll see you'll see schools that take any kid that wants to come there. Most of them are not Catholic. Let's move on and do two more questions, and then we're going to wrap it up. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Clint, I, I'm kind of a first generation uh, pro choice uh, person going back to tuition and tax credits and, you know, that old group. <laughs> uh, what I worry about listening to the discussion here today is the suggestion that this free choice is going to solve the problem of the inner city urban school. And I think, let's say we spend $5 trillion over the next 20 years, what percentage of that $5 trillion is going to go to benefit the inner uh, city urban school? And is it not possible that the urban school, public school, will be much weakened, and the alternative schools for the inner city st uh, students will not be as good as the old public school, which we decrease? <coughs> And at the same time, the suburban middle class people going to the religious schools will be receiving a greater portion of the dollars we're spending. The way I see it, we're still a country willing to give room and board tuition in prison at twenty-five to thirty-two thousand a year, and maybe twenty-five hundred dollar uh, voucher system, and trying to justify it as a savior of the inner core city system and call it now civil rights, we're looking, I'm asking a question between promise and delivery on what you're thinking about. I know where your heart is, but I'm not sure we're going to end up there. Well, I think that's a, a fair question. I would, um, I would point you to not only the programs that currently exist in Milwaukee and Cleveland, which are named, um, almost exclusively toward low-income people in the inner city, but also to the proposals that are, that are seriously proceeding around the country, and they are almost entirely the same. In fact, of the eight or so serious school choice proposals uh, that I'm aware of around the country today, all of them, except uh, Pennsylvania's, um, are targeted exclusively either to low-income kids or to kids who are in failing schools. And Pennsylvania is aimed primarily at that, but also includes middle-class kids. So I think, I think the sense of urgency and priority is definitely greatest um, with respect to the, pop the very population that you are also most concerned about. However, I do think that something else has to happen, and a couple of the speakers have talked about uh, this today, uh, Joe, most recently, and that is that the public schools have got to be radically reformed at the same time. And I see vouchers as playing a very positive role in coaxing those schools to do it. Initially in Milwaukee, there was a feeling of just total resistance to vouchers. Now, I think uh, even the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, which is uh, editorialized against the Choice Program for nine years now, grudgingly admitted a couple of weeks ago that that for, that that choice had created a reform environment in Milwaukee in the public schools that hadn't existed before. So I I think we have to proceed with vouchers, but also with charter schools. Again, focused in the inner city primarily, and that's where most of them have, have come up. Sorry for being long on that response, but okay. Last question. I hear. Yes. Uh, everybody from Mrs. Lewis who started to speak and others have been impressed and aware of the great problem of in the inner city and other places where there are some students who are not going to be literate and they're not going to accomplish what or be given the right opportunity. Uh, I'm a lawyer and in a way uh, I kind of resent the last of uh, all the talks about the civil rights and the great idealism that that movement represented. To me, it's like trying the fact. I mean, the, the, the lawyer's story is, you got a case where the facts are against you, don't try the facts, try the people. Go off the prejudice, you see. And so I'm saying to you, the basic points of discussion today should be, if you have the charter schools or the doctor system, 
how are you better going to meet the problem? What are the specifics? What are the mechanics? What are the details that enable you to do that? If you're going to, and that's the key problem, don't compare apples with apples, oranges with oranges. Unfortunately, I've got to leave. I've got to stay here. That's why I say to you, point out the facts. Lawyers, and judges, politicians, spin control people are at this rhetoric, rhetoric. They can cover up anything. I think you're I think you're misinformed as to apples and oranges. Well, when we go back to the Brown decision, which the lawyers argue on behalf of real people, uh, the well, Brown just said the Brown decision, you know, was not a question of academic achievement. It was a question of the elimination of jury segregation by <laughs> issue of governmental action which separated children of Negro children from others of similar age and qualifications solely on the basis of their race. That was not a case about academic achievement. Now, I'm hoping that in all this experimentation with public school systems and, and that we're going, to, we're going to have a situation where we can, yes, get academic achievement and real rigorous standards of, of, and, and accountability in that regard. But at the same time, I'm not going to give up on the notion that we started with in Brown, that racial isolation in the public school system is a really serious problem. And that's not apples and oranges. And I'm also hoping that the Chicago system, which is an effort to reform the public school system through a, through a system of neural control and accountability, and getting rid of contracts for administrators and supervisors, and making sure that teachers are held accountable and high expectations for all students, that that system is on, <coughs> you know, on all of us. Michael, I just want to acknowledge that um, 40 years ago, liberals did indeed represent real people. <laughs> <laughs> Take a seven-minute break, and then the final panel will uh, convene back in here at 4:30.